Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to On Point. This episode, I sit down with Brian to talk about the Alabama whitetail hunt. He invited me over on a lease property he's got, and uh, it was a great time. My first uh, time ever hunting out of state over in Alabama, ever hunting for whitetail. So there's a lot of firsts for me here. So you guys that have grew up hunting these things might get a kind of a kick of my uh, surprises when I got over there and just the stark differences versus the deer we have over here in Oregon. And uh, just talked about arrow setups and tuning a little bit. Just a great conversation. And I really appreciate Brian for having me over there and uh, coming on the podcast to talk about it. So outside of that, this is the first episode of the 2020 New Year. Uh, took a little bit of a time off, been dealing with some stuff medically, and just wanted to uh, say thanks for everybody's patience. I had a few guys reach out, wonder what was going on, and uh, just really appreciate that. I should be back up to uploading once or twice a week again moving forward and i have some big plans for 2020 i'll come out with another episode explaining that so outside of that appreciate everybody listening and i'll see you at the end bye so you invited me to come over and hunt alabama whitetail it was a doe management hunt and uh i've i don't think i've actually ever shot a doe until that hunt (laughs) so but well, that's what you were saying. Yeah, it didn't take much convincing because I was like, man, I want to go hang out and just have a good time. And so, um, gosh, you know, you talked about it and hinted about it earlier in the year, but I've had so many offers fall through. I kind of just like, we'll just see, you know, what happens and stuff. And and um, right, you called me, what, month before? Month and a half? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you're like, it's on, man. Come on out. So... I literally bought a plane ticket, and uh, there's a story there about the wrong plane ticket on the way back. So that was an ex- expensive <laughs> endeavor. But uh, <laughs> I had a freaking blast, man. And I know you said the hunting wasn't that good because of the weather, and it was a little too hot. But I went there with the mindset that, you know, I'm just going to have a good time, and I know I'm probably going to see some deer, probably get a shot at one. And regardless, irregardless, I'm going to have a freaking good time. And, and we did. I had a great time. I can't speak for you, but um, it was a blast, man. I really appreciate you flying or not flying me, uh, having me out there and, and um, let me come over and get my butt kicked by some of your does. <laughs> well, they are not um, uh, they are not very forgiving uh, when it comes to uh, warm, wet weather, uh, very low winds. Uh, they, they pretty much can show off all their skills <laughs> and, uh, man, they, they, they work on you pretty hard. Uh, it was, I mean, who would imagine, uh, 70 degree weather and raining, uh, for yeah. four days straight, you know, uh, at the end of December. Yeah. But it happens. You know, it was, uh, there was thunder and lightning there too, while I was there sitting in a tree stand. But so what, what should yeah, it have I been? I mean, when it's raining. No, which is, which is no. way opposite. Just the whole time I was just, I felt like I was, you know, I was asking questions the whole time, but the, just the differences between blacktail and being out in the rain, it's like, that's like, you better be out. If it's raining, the bucks are out, the deer are out. And then the whitetail, they're just a 180. It's really weird. It's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, for whatever reason, the deer just, they just don't like to move when it's, when it's raining in the South for whatever reason. I mean, you'll see a few, but it's just, it's not like, uh, not like it should be. And, you know, I don't know if the, I I just, I don't know what it is. I know that when it's wet, that the scent is amplified and Mm -hmm. it may just kind of have them freaked out. Um, but normally when it's raining, it's hot and the wind is swirling and it's just, it's just not good conditions. So, I normally don't hunt when it's raining, but when I have people that have flown all the way from the opposite <laughs> corner of the country to hunt, you know, we got to play the hand we're dealt. And man, I tell you what, that's the, that's, I tell you what, that's the, the, the toughest butt kicking I've taken from our deer in, in quite a while. It was, it was tough. That's funny. I was talking to somebody about that. I'm like, how was the hunt? I'm like, well, if you ask Brian, <laughs> it was the worst hunt he's had in a long time. But if you ask me, it was a freaking, it was a ball. But uh, it just seems like my luck, man, when it goes to out-of-state hunting, I bring the shittiest weather with me. Whether, like in Namibia, they had a uh, uh, like a five-year drought going on, which was great for bow hunting because water, you know, you could use water to your advantage, especially during that drought. Like, it was crazy. 
Well, when we get there, like that five year drought ended, uh, thunderstorms, rain. <laughs> it was like he, the, the guy, just threw his hands up and he's like, "I don't know, man. Like you're just wrong time." And then uh, Idaho, uh, two years ago, or last year, two years ago, the, the warmest weather they had in a while during when I was there. And the bucks hadn't moved down yet. Um, Alabama. <laughs> 20 degrees warmer than it should have been thunder so I, I don't know if i was ever meant to hunt out of state i don't know well i don't know i think you left it here because <laughs> i rolled out of the farm today it should have been 50s during the day or what yeah yeah normally you will normally you'll get like a high of 60 and then but you'll get like you know 35 to 40 at you know in the mornings and in the evenings mm-hmm uh, and then January, it'll usually get down to freezing every night, get a little frost, and then, you know, high in the 50s, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and uh, But it's just been terrible. But that's what we're getting this weekend. It's finally moving in to normal-type weather. So, you know, the, the deer should be cranking at this point. Well, just on that one, we had one decent morning where it got down to like 40 or 45, yep, somewhere down yep. there. And just that one morning, it was like a light switch, man. It was like... The bucks were grunting and, and chasing, and I had this one, um, uh, like technically, I guess it would be an eight-point, but uh, it was like a three-point with eye guards for the Western guys, but it was an eight-point, yeah. your guys' uh, count, and uh, it, I was trying to shoot a doe, and it kept scaring all the does off, and I was like, you little bastard, but, um, you know, so just that one morning, I mean, even before daylight, I was in the stand, just before daylight, I could hear him grunting in like, I don't know, this really tall grass, almost looked like Thule's. But um, it was uh, it was just really cool seeing the dynamic and him chase around all the does and uh, you know another little spike that came in and he screwed me about two or three times on a on a few does I was wanting to shoot but just how aggressive they are compared to blacktail you know the the Colombians over here the whitetails we have they're they're definitely more aggressive than the blacktails but those eastern ones that you guys got they're even more aggressive and it was just really cool to actually see that. Oh, they go full send when it comes to rut. You know, it's just, you know, they just won't do it if it's not cold, you know. And then the, you know, the rain just freaks them out for whatever reason. So, hmm. you know, I usually stay out of most of those areas when the conditions are crappy like that because, you know, you heard all the deer that were blowing at you and all the whole time. And I just usually don't go in there and hunt uh, because I don't want to you know, get them, you know, kind of spooked and wired to, you know, pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, cause it's almost just, it's, it just, you end up doing, you end up doing more damage than good in my mind. So I normally stay out of areas until the conditions are perfect. And then I just slip in there and, um, but you know, there's some years you don't have that luxury. It just, it just, you don't have very much good weather and you just got to hunt what you got. And that's kind of what's going on this year. You know, it's, you yeah. just, it's, it's just a tough year. So, so with the property that we were hunting on, um, it's, uh, I had some guys that are from the area that are, or that I've hunted Alabama. Um, they're asking me what uh-huh. area and it was like near Fredrickson or Fredericks or, um, I forget what uh, the Fitzpatrick. name was. Fitzpatrick. That's what it was. Fitzpatrick. And then, uh, once they found that out, you know, they're like, Oh crap, that's big buck country, you know? And, and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, cool. I'm here to shoot does, but um, duly noted. <laughs> but uh, they yeah. were all excited once they found out, you know, where about about where I was hunting, and and um, they were kind of excited for me to get my butt kicked. I know, I know that's what they were thinking. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's it's it's historically uh, one of the better areas of the state, and um, I've hunted it, you know, my entire life. So it's just what I'm used to. Uh, but other guys from other parts of the state, they, they, you know, all want to kind of try to get in that area and hunt. It's just that particular area just has, you know, larger landowners. So there's fewer landowners and it's bigger places. And, uh, it's just a lot less opportunity, you know, to, to get in somewhere. Hmm. So, you know, I grew up, I grew up there, so it was easy. It's easy for me just because, you know, you know, you know, everybody or you're related to everybody, one of the two. <laughs> right. So. Right. Well, when I was there, I was just yeah. wanting to learn as much as I could about Alabama hunting. And, and I, you know, I was asking you questions, you know, like what, what's the public land opportunity over there? And, and then you were saying down South, there's a little bit, but it's not like it's crap. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, well, it's just real hard hunting, you know? And I mean, 
you know, you're going to hunt, you're going to hunt all year, you know, archery hunt all year for a, uh, you know, an opportunity at a, just an average deer, you know, mm-hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, you know, that's how I grew up hunting. I grew up hunting, uh, public land. And then I also grew up hunting timber company land, very similar to kind of what you guys have, where you buy a, uh, a timber company permit and you can hunt all of their land. Mm-hmm. And that was a thing years ago. And that's what everybody did. Um, but back then, you know, the, the timber company permit was only like $15 hmm. and you could hunt everything that the timber company had, you know, and you could go buy different ones. And, but as I got older, you know, the lease game became really popular and that's pretty much all it is now is leases. Yeah, I was just talking, the way it is. You yeah, know? there's a gentleman at the airport I ran into, and, and he saw my bow case, and so he struck up a conversation about, you know, you know, am I going somewhere to hunt, or was I coming back, or do I let, you know, and um, I told him it was my first time in Alabama, and, and he got all excited because he was a local, and he said, uh, um, you know, he, he didn't ask where I was going. He's at, He had basically asked, you know, basically what lease or where's your lease because he knew there just wasn't any public land in, in that area, and and uh, he had his own couple, like, I guess, hunting clubs or something. Um, yep. Or, uh-huh. like, really popular over there because that's how most people can afford to hunt a private lease is through, like, a hunting club. Um, that's exactly right. And you just divide it up between a bunch of guys and make it affordable. And, yeah. Um, and the good thing about that is, is you know who's there and when they're there. You know, unlike public land, you don't know what the other people are doing. Hmm. Well, that's, you know, so that's that's the that's the advantage of having a lease and a club with guys is at least you're organized to some degree, you know? Yeah. Well, it was nice knowing, you know, you knew exactly what was in there. Um, you know, you had trail, trail camp pictures everywhere. I don't, you and I spent half a day or a few hours at least, uh, setting up, um, trail cams and, and just checking trail cams, which I thought was a blast, but, um, there's a lot of work that you put into that lease. It's not like you just show up and shoot something. I mean, you're putting in hours and hours and hours and hours of labor to make this property, oh, yeah. you know, what it is. I mean, I know it's it's got his, some historical value. You know, people that have hunted it in the past and have, who have leased it in the past have got some pretty big names and stuff. And just being able to be a part of that, like when you're driving me around and like, uh, you know, Snyder and Call and... and um, this guy and, and it just Wes, you know, sat in this tree stand. It was like, really, you know, I was, I was sitting in stands that guys, I, I either know or look up to in the industry or have heard, or have heard about. Um, I was like, man, I, I get to say I was in the same tree stand as this guy now, you know, like I just thought that was That's really, right. really kind of special. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I remember, I remember telling you that, uh, Cody, uh, had hunted, you know, hunted in the, a certain area and you said, I didn't know that, Cody Kellum had hunted down here and I said, yeah, he, he had hunted down. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that have hunted with me over the years down there. And, uh, you know, we've always just had a good time. And, um, I, you know, if I didn't have a bunch of friends, uh, that just didn't love coming down there and hunting, uh, especially this time of year when everything's closed out West, uh, you know, I don't know that I would do what I do. Uh, cause it's a lot of work and it's a lot of money. I would, you know, if it was just me, uh, I would probably, you know, focus my time traveling and doing other hunts, you know, but yeah. I get, I get so much enjoyment just by having guys from out West come down and do it because it's just, everybody is just in awe of the long seasons and the bag limits and all the animals and the opportunities and, they just, I don't know. I just, I really enjoy seeing guys just get a kick out of it and have a blast, you know? And then, you know, I mean, heck, most of the time guys come down, you know, they're shooting four or five deer in a few days with their bow. <laughs> right. And that's, that's an entire season or two for most people out West. Yeah. That'd be like two years over here in Oregon. Uh, you know, best case scenario, that'd be two years. Most people, like 90% of people, it's a deer a year and you're done. Um, it's probably more yeah. than that, unless you unless you get a doe tag or you work you work the system like some guys do. Um, you know that what I did over there, what it took me two years. You know, it was like man, you know, this was it was you know, it was really special for me. But for somebody that's lived over there, they probably I don't know if they'd take it for granted or not. But 
Um, and and I, you and I have had conversations off the podcast where you where you talk about how the the situation that Alabama has over there that you can shoot just a a enormous amount of animals compared to us Western guys, and that really plays in a benefit to you know your hunting, your your woodsmanship skills, your shot. You know, just it just makes a more complete hunter in those scenarios. And and after just watching you and 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 kind of just learning from you as as we, as we went over there and and we hunted together, I could totally see it. Like it is totally, absolutely a, a factor that you guys shooting. I mean, I'm not sure how many you've got this year. It's quite a few, but uh, just managing the herd, um, you'll get more experience shooting deer and you know actually shots on deer in one year or two years than most guys will in thirty years. Literally thirty years over here. It's insane. It is, it's crazy. I mean, you know, just, I mean, the amount of deer that I have to track, uh, in one year, Mm -hmm. you know, a a lot of times will be the aggregate of the amount of animals that somebody from out West will track their whole life. Right. You know, cause you can't just take what I shoot annually. You take, you know, all the guests and the other guys that come and, you know, and, and, you know, 60, 70 deer a year, you know, and, you know, <laughs> half of them, you have to track them, you know, so yeah, uh, they don't all fall within sight. Uh, but yeah, so you just get a lot of experience of following, you know, tracking game and you get a lot of experience on, uh, animal behavior, which is invaluable. Um, you get a lot of experience, um, you know, actually shooting animals with a bow. And that's the hardest thing is guys spend so much time, I think, shooting at targets and 3D ranges. And it's just, while it's super important, I feel that it's just totally different than shooting live animals. For sure. And you just cannot put uh, a value of the importance of having the opportunities to just shoot over and over and over and over and over. You know, I mean, how many, how many times, I mean, what opportunities do people have? Let's say that you get in a stand one morning and you kind of goof up and make a bad shot and you miss. Well, out West, you may have to wait the entire season to get another shot to where we are. You can usually in a few minutes or another hour or so have another shot. So you get to say, okay, you blew that opportunity. Here's what you did wrong. Now let's do it right. And you can do that while it's still fresh. And it, you just, it's just, uh, it's an incredible opportunity to hone your skills for sure. It would be cool. Like what time does your guys' season start over there? For October about? 15th. October 15th. Okay. It's later than I was, I was thinking, cause it would be invaluable for, for guys that I like want to get tuned. Like I, I shoot and I, I'm like one of the guys you're talking about. I shoot a lot. I'm constantly playing with different gear and just seeing what shoots, what doesn't shoot, what, what I like. And, and it would be invaluable for, to have a spot or a place where you could go like in August and you could go and have a, a hunt where you shoot six, eight, 10 animals, and then really hone your stuff before you start having these elk hunts and these backcountry you know, mule deer hunts or other, not, I'm not saying more important hunts, but to the hunter, probably a more valuable hunt, um, as far as experience and stuff. Um, man, that well, would be nice. That's what we do with the hogs. That's what you do with the hogs. Yeah. See that may, that totally makes yeah, sense. The, yeah. So we hog hunt, we'll start hog hunt in August, early September, uh, especially, you know, like this year, you know, this year before I went, I went out to uh, New Mexico. I think the, I think I got out there the fifteenth and hunted the second half of the season. Mm-hmm. And like the first week in September, um, you know, I hog hunted. I guess three days that week, um, and I was really just really wanted to get a lot of confidence, you know, shooting a, shooting at a live animal, and also I wanted to get confidence in my equipment you know, make sure that the, you know, everything was flying right. I was getting good penetration and pass throughs and, you know, it's just, it's, it's invaluable to be able to test all that before you actually go, you know, to the, you know, an incredible 
you know, Western hunt and, um, and, and you've got, you know, already got some animals down within the, in the few weeks of you getting there. It's just, I don't know. It's been a great advantage for me. I, I don't think I would be near as successful as I am on my trips whenever I am successful. Uh, if it wasn't for, you know, where I live and the opportunities I've had for the last 30 something years of bow hunting down here. Oh, I, I, I could totally see it just when, um, cause I, I shot two does on the very last sit. Um, and those were the first, for, those were my only, only deer. I mean, it took six sits to finally get a shot. I mean, we'd hunted morning and evening every day. And then, uh, I had one doe, I, I swear to God, she had an eye in the back of her head. Um, when I was trying to draw, she just cranked her head around and was like, not today, sir. And <laughs> it was like, there's no way your peripherals were that that far because she was quartered away from me at a hard 45 and I waited for her to pretty much get past me before I even started to draw and right when I started putting tension on the string she turned her head around I'm like there's just no way and she had me dead rice and took (laughs) off and and so you know there was there was one I got busted once um trying to draw my bow and then uh the next time I tried to draw my bow I shot and I remember just just drilling with you over and over again what range where to aim because you're you're the whole time you're telling me guys shoot high, they always shoot high. They either miss or they'll they'll spine a deer because they're just not aiming low enough. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> so, um, right. And uh, so I I just I I shot you know every day while I was there I shot out to 40 yards and shot out of the tr- uh, practice tree stand you had next to camp and um, just was really worried about not being one of those guys. And so I had this doe come in on the sixth, on the sixth sit last, very last evening. And, uh, she came in 25 yards and I drew, didn't get busted. And, um, I put it basically right on the bottom of her heart, like almost, almost on the line of her belly. Uh, and I'm like, okay. And then using my hinge release, I pre-clicked my, my hinge, so it didn't make a loud click when I drew or uh, settled in. And I felt like I made literally the perfect shot. I didn't see where my arrow hit, but I knew I hit her. And um, 45, so I text you, I'm like, finally, I got one. <laughs> and you're like, good, get another one. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you said, did she run off? I said, yes. And you're like, perfect, kill another one. <laughs> and um, and just so people know, uh, the, the daily uh, limit, in Alabama is one doe a day unless you're on the um, uh, Alabama Conservation Department's uh, herd management plan, which we are. And under that plan, they tell us how many does they want. They recommend we should take off the property. And Mm -hmm. as long as it's within the season, uh, we can take as many per day as possible until we hit that number. So that's the, just so people know. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you because I, I, I just went over there and did yeah. what I was told to do. And uh, <laughs> I don't want right. to get that's in right. trouble or anything, get anybody in trouble. But no, 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 there's nothing to get in trouble about. I just, you know, I know we've had this conversation before when other people have been here and somebody makes a comment. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you just said you shot two in a day and the limit's one a day, but that's, but that's if you're not on a plan on one of the, um, you know, the, the management plans through the state. Right. Well, I was wanting to get into that too. Um, but so we, uh, we'll talk about that cause that's the next part of the story is, yeah. is, uh, you know, 45 minutes later, another doe walks out and, um, I didn't see the other one go down, but I knew I made a good shot. I just knew it. I mean, that pin was buried right where I'd practiced and it was low, uh, lower than what I would have aimed. And, uh, she, she comes up and my, my arrow sticking in the ground and I could see with my binoculars, it's just covered in blood. Um, and she goes up and she's sniffing my arrow. I'm like, well, I think I know where the range is there. <laughs> and so I just pull up and, and, um, you know, it, she was probably at 26, uh, 27 yards, but I, I aimed for 25 again. And I aimed, uh, I aimed, I thought I hit low on the doe that I shot the first one. So I aimed right on the heart yeah. on, the, on the second one and, uh, felt really good about it. Like I said, I, be, I was using my hands and, and just was loving the the, the shot execution uh, I was getting on those on those deer in live action situations, and uh, I spined her. I mean, she dropped. I mean, I when when she dropped, I'm like, wow, that was interesting. And then I saw my arrow. I'm like, oh god, I did it. I spined her. I'm like, I'm one of those guys. And so I I quickly put another one in her, and, and it was over with. But 
I was just like, man, you know, where did I hit that first one if I aimed a little higher on that one? And um, turns out I hit the other one high, like probably high in the top of the scapula. I'm not really sure. Yeah, we, we the tracked tops the, of the shoulders. Yeah, I mean, we we tracked her the best uh, the best we could, but um, you know, unfortunately, I hate to say that that one actually got away from me, and that's the one of the first deer I could think of, probably the first deer I could think of um, that I've lost with a bow. Um, I've lost a few elk with the bow, but well, that that deer bow. that deer was uh, I don't believe that deer was mortally wounded. To be honest with you, I think that deer still still rolling. So. Uh, I've, I've seen so many of those deer shot, you know, high to the shoulder, you know, um, just kind of right through that meaty, meaty section and, and they just keep, keep on trucking, you know, and mm. cause you, you know, these, these animals have so many scars and battle wounds on them and gouges. And I mean, it's just, you know, we killed one there this year that had one of its eyes, you know, poked out and the ear ripped out of socket and, Oh, geez. I mean, they're just, they live a hard life. And, you know, uh, a razor sharp, you know, arrow zipping through the top of their shoulder, you know, it's not what you want to see, but it's certainly not any worse than what they experience on a daily basis, you know, mm-hmm. in the wild. Um, but I think that one was, was definitely uh, probably, I think that one's probably still kicking around because there just wasn't enough blood there to, you know, tell me otherwise. And then, you know, once she went down the creek, uh, down that creek bed, uh-huh. and we got a little blood there, and then she turned up back up the other side, and there was not any. Uh, I knew at that point that it was a high forward shot. So, mm. uh, and that's just from tracking, you know, literally thousand plus animals or more, probably. You know, no joke. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so. Um, and I learned something on that so one anyway. too, um, you know, cause I, I always knew that high shots take a little longer to get blood cause it has to fill up the cavity before it pumps out. And, and, uh, mm-hmm. uh and, and on that one, you're like, you got better blood going downhill. I'm like, sweet. And you're like, well, no, that's because of this. I was like, oh, shit, I never thought of that. Like, so I'm learning stuff just from your, you know, literally a hundred times more tracking jobs than I've ever done. Um, probably more than that. Uh, just learning more parts of the puzzle to a certain area that where it gets hit. I, I, I never thought of it um, coming out better when it's going downhill because of where the hole would be and where that blood's moving to in the cavity. I'm like, that's really interesting. So um, just, just stuff that yeah, I'm, it's I'm just picking the things up. you learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the stuff you learn over the years. And, you know, I, I, um, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't ever stress to guys enough that, the farther away the deer is, um, the lower you have to aim. And once you get past 20 and you get into that 25 to 30 range, you have to aim off the deer. Mm -hmm. Like if your pin is on the deer, especially those does, it's, you know, you're going to either miss them high or hit them real high. That's just, that's just how much they move. I mean, they're, it's like, it's like the matrix, man. (laughs) Yeah. No joke. They, they, they're, they're wired. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had deer in that field. I had, I was covered up in deer from about 45. I don't know how long I was sitting there. Um, but I, I was sitting there and then just all of a sudden just deer everywhere. And then it was like, holy smokes. I had deer at 50, 60. And I was like, I didn't even grab my bow. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Not after the conversations I've heard, you know, Brian talk, but I hadn't shot at a deer yet at this point. And then when that one walked out at, at 25, I thought I was aiming low enough and, and like you said, a deer at 30, I don't even know if I would take that shot. And I've shot deer, you know, I'm not bragging. I'm just, this is just fact. I've shot deer over 90 yards away and, uh, you know, didn't even hesitate. Cause I just knew that deer would let me hit it. it I've, I've shot three deer that would li- literally watch the arrow hit them past 70. And, uh, these whitetail, I wouldn't even think about a shot past 30. Like I wouldn't even. I wouldn't have the confidence. I feel like it would be pretty much too much luck. They're just you just can't control the situation enough. You're relying on the animal too much. And I and I know I just said I shot at a mule deer at at, at ninety um, and killed it and everything good. But that's just the difference in in deer and how 
much they're switched on. Like I feel comfortable doing that on a mule deer. Like they're, they're half retarded most of the time when you're shooting at them. These whitetail, it's just a yeah. different ball game. It's different. I, I've been preaching it for years. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, I don't shoot whitetails over 30 and I don't shoot anything else over 40. Mm-hmm. And the few times that I have done it and pushed it, even though I knew better, it hasn't been a good experience. You know, it's taken a follow up arrow or something like that. And mm-hmm. I just don't like it, you know. And, you know, I've had so many people say, well, you know, you only get so many opportunities and I'm not going to pass up, you know, a shot if I think I can make it. And I don't agree with that at all. And I mean, I've been extremely successful with a bow over the last 30 something years and I've pretty much adhered to that rule. And it, it's not ever, you know, impeded my success. Mm-hmm. You know, you just usually if you nine times out of 10, if you'll wait, you're going to get a better shot. But the more you're out there, you know, animal behavior and, you know, you know, kind of what they're going to do. And there's a lot of times, you know, you know, I've got about 10 seconds and I'm going to have one window. I've got to take it. I'm never going to see this animal again. And that's when you've got to have autopilot kick in and everything's got to be super simple no thought process Mm -hmm. not picking up your range finder just see it no it's inside a certain range draw aim kill i mean so you know it's not a one size fits all but you know you you just can't you can't take shots at animals at long distances especially when they're moving or keyed up and expect a good result it's going to be a low percentage shot, you know? I could definitely attest to that after this white tail because <laughs> neither of these does were looking at me or anything when I shot them. Um, that one doe was kind of tense because she was sniffing the arrow of that one that passed through that other, that other doe, and so she was probably more more tense than the first doe. But, um, yeah, I mean, and, and when, when me personally, as, as a bow hunter, I'm more proud of the close shots than I am the far shots. Like, a lot of these guys, they'll take a long shot, uh, and then they'll brag about it. And that's why I, I'm very clear when I bring up, you know, some of the farther shots I've taken, you know, I'm more proud of the 17 yard shot or the 10 yard shot that I took or 10 times more. Cause I, to me, I, I was more successful of a bow hunter, even though the, the outcome was the same. Um, you know, I'm more proud of that 10 times more proud of that 10 yard shot than I am a 60, 70 yard shot. And that's just because I well, feel like I did my job. Close to him. What was that? I said, it's just fun getting close. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, it's just a different experience. You know, it's it's the same reason that you don't get the same experience. You don't get the same feeling. And I know I've heard the, the comparison between trad and compound. Um, it's a completely different experience because you're that much closer, you know. For sure. You know, what's funny is, is that, you know, probably half the animals I've killed over the last 30 plus years has been with a trad bow. And... But to be completely honest with you, and I think I told you this, it's never really been a disadvantage to me to shoot one. It's never been that big of a deal, only because I don't shoot far. Hmm. So the shots that I would take with a compound usually are trad shots anyway. So, you know, it's just, it never was that big of a, of an adjustment for me to go to a trad bow. And, I mean, I went to a trad bow because we were shooting, you know, 15, 20 hogs a year, 15 or 20 deer a year. And I mean, that's, you know, it just made it a incredible challenge and it made it really fun, you know? Right. Um, it's, uh, I hate to say it, but it's almost, sometimes it almost feels like work. You know, <laughs> when I get to this time of year and I know I've still got to shoot 20 more does. Mm-hmm. It's, uh man, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's tough. <laughs> you know? It's a weird so, problem to have. And know, just hearing I, you even say, it, it's just, it's like, what? <laughs> but on this property, when yeah, I, I tell people, um, what the management goals were that were set by the folks that you send your, your stuff off to, um, they said kill 70. And then I'm like 70 does. Yeah, they, one said, property. they said, yeah, they said, shoot, shoot 50. And if you, you know, get those down pretty early. We're probably going to bump you up to 70. Um, and it's just, 
you know, it, it's, it, it's impossible because I don't have any help doing it. You know, and like normally when I bring somebody like you in that time of year and you've got great temperatures and steady winds, you know, you're shooting at least one a day, you know, sometimes two to three a day. So if you're there four days, you probably kill, you know, eight to 10 does. Well, that's, man, that's a lick for me, you know, that, that we've, you know, gotten, uh, you know, gotten out of the herd. I mean, that's what we're looking to do. And I know it sounds crazy to people, but the difference in the animals, uh, the, 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 the health of them, you know, for the whole herd, it's just amazing when you work to keep the numbers down. Um, you can visibly see the difference in the browse lines when you're taking that many deer out. And so, hmm. you know, we've got our neighbors that are doing the same thing. So it's not like it's just us, it's us and our, our adjoining neighbor. So it, it just makes a huge difference. And, uh, you know, we just, we don't have a, like a much of a natural attrition rate with our animals because they're just super healthy, you know? Well, that and you don't have and any. I attribute uh, that to keeping the numbers down. We don't have any cougars or bears that I know of. Um, we talked about that. That like you no. guys are the management tool. Like there's no, there's no wolves, there's no bears, and there's not really any cougars. And you said there's bears down on the very southern no. tip of the state, but where we were at, it's it's yep. it's you. It's us, and yeah, we have coyotes, but they really spend the majority of their time on small game. You know, they just, they don't, they don't pull a lot of deer down, you know, not what people like, what people think. Hmm. So, you know, the, these, these deer herds just go completely unchecked and, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it I enjoy it sim- simply for the fact that I get to get a lot of experience putting arrows through animals and seeing all the different scenarios play out. So whenever I'm designing, you know, a product, I mean, I've pretty much, if it's, if it can happen, I've pretty much seen it and, and seen it, you know, in volume, you know, multiple times. Mm -hmm. So it just, it's just a really a beneficial thing for me. Um, just to have the, the, the real world experience to know, how to design a broadhead or an arrow or whatever else we, we do. And, um, so, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't want to say that coming off like a pecker head, but <laughs> you know, I mean, our stuff's just not designed on a computer with computer models and, you know, theory it's designed from use <laughs> and lots and lots of use and lots of lots of results. And uh, I, I just think it makes a big difference, and I think it shows. Well, I, I can tell you that last year I used the kudu all year because that was uh, – was it last year? Yeah, last year I used the kudus all year because that was the number one broadhead I was getting asked about. You know, how does it work? You know, blood trails, this and that. I'm like, well, you know, I've tested it, but I haven't hunted with it. So I hunted with it all year last year. I think I killed three animals last year with it. And developed my opinion on it. And then this year, it seemed to be the day six setup and, and, the, and the gear and the broadheads and everything. And so I, I hunted with your stuff all year. Uh, and I I don't think I've ever had a more favorite broadhead that I've ever shot personally. I think this is definitely my favorite broadhead that I've ever shot. And I keep every one, <laughs> which, is, which is different than you. you. You'll wash it off and reuse it. I, I'm more of a uh, phlegmatic type of guy. So if I use an arrow and a broadhead, it's, it's, it's usually hung with the animal skull or it's, it's kept in a, a drawer <laughs> so I can go back and look at yeah. it and, and stuff. So, which gets expensive, but, um, I can go yeah, back I and told look you, at, when you were telling me that I said, hell, if I did that, we'd be bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, luckily I don't live in Alabama. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, and so I could go back and look at the heads and the arrows that I used to your stuff this year, and I didn't get to retrieve anything off that hog because it it was gone in the tulies, but um, the arrow on the broadhead was. But on the elk and the deer that I I shot, um, even on that one that I spined, there wasn't. I didn't think there was a chip. I'd have to go back and look at it. I'm like ninety nine percent sure you could wash that thing back off and use it again, and it hit it hit a spine. I mean that's that's a pretty large bone for it to hit, and uh, 
I, I like I, I'm like pretty dang sure there's not even a chip in there. And uh, I'd be cool yeah. if there was because that's that's understandable. But I mean, it held up, and I used them in the rain all year this year. And um, not, not to sound like a sales pitch or anything, but um, you know, I've got friends that use other heads that rust, and me personally. I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you bought a Ferrari, there's special Ferrari maintenance or stuff you'd have to buy to maintain it. But I, I just don't like the thought of spending a lot of money on a head and then having to maintain it um, using, you know, some sort of coating, wax, oil, whether it's cheap or not. I've got buddies that they don't think it's a big deal until it is. And then they look at their quiver third week of season and they got rusty broadheads. And, uh, you know, for well, me. Well, rust is, the, rust is enemy number one of the, of a, of a sharp edge yeah and, because you know rust is going to attack the thinnest part of the metal first well in oregon it's i mean that's what you're doing a lot of times this year it was super wet super wet and uh, a lot yep. of rain and during during elk season it's like i mean i checked them just because i was curious i was like i wonder if i have any rust or anything on these i'm like i know they're not supposed to and, and there wasn't but you know about September 20th, I'm starting to hear mumblings and groanings about guys either having to tone, you know, do maintenance on their heads because of all the rain we had. And it's like, man, you know, I didn't have to do that. And I've never had to do that. Um, but you know, this, this just speaking of the quality, man, I, I appreciate you, you know, coming out with that head and, and the arrow system. And, and I get a lot of questions on that and then being able to use them all year. I, I didn't have one failure. Um, and I get asked all the time, how do they fly? And, and they fly fine. Once I had my bow tuned, that being the caveat, once I had my bow tuned, um, they flew yep. fine. They flew great out to 80 to 100 yards. I was getting great groups. I mean, it's it's as good as I could shoot. Well, I, well, I know we were going to talk about just hunting tonight, but mm -hmm. I do have to tell you, uh, you, you brought that up. I'm going to give you a, a kind of an anecdote to that uh, or some support to that. So two of my partners in the camp there, they're down this week, you know, the worst week of, of weather we've ever had. And they came down because <laughs> uh, it's the only time time would allow for them, you know, mm -hmm. and they brought their bows and, uh, you know, I built some arrows last year and um, uh, they got some broadheads uh, this year before they went to Iowa. They both drew uh, Iowa tags together and went to on a big Iowa hunt. And I asked them, you know, y'all got, do y'all have everything set up? Is everything tuned? Is everything ready? And they, and they live in Virginia. So, you know, I'm, I'm not right there with them. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got it. Everything's great. Um, only problem we have is that we had to go buy new targets because your arrows were blowing through the targets we've always used. Hmm. So we had to go get a different type of target. So, cause the layered targets wouldn't hold them. So anyway, when they got back, they did not have good stories to tell. Uh, they were not successful. I'll just leave it at that. And so I said, well, man, did, you know, did the heads not perform or, and they both said, well, we didn't shoot them. We shot expandables. Oh, mm -hmm. and I said, well, why in the world would you do that? And they said, well, to be honest, we couldn't get the broadheads the fly right, you know, and these guys don't shoot their bows a lot. That's just, that's one thing I'm going to tell you right now. Um, but they said, we just couldn't get them to fly right and went to the shop and they said, just put expandables on them and they'll fly like your field tips. So anyway, both of the guys lost deer. That's basically the moral of the story. Very expensive Iowa, you know, four year draw, five year draw tag. Really? So, Today, you know how I shoot on the front porch of the, mm -hmm. of the cabin? Mm -hmm. So it's 30 yards from end to end across the front porch of the cabin, so 90 feet or whatever. So I set, they both had their bows today, this morning, and I got up early and I got out there and I took the first bow and I took, stripped the veins off of uh, the air, they, and thank goodness they shoot the same arrow. I set them up. They basically have identical bows, and I shot, set them up with the same arrow. So I stripped the veins off one, and I shot uh, at 20 yards. I shot uh, their four fletch arrow first, 
and hit uh, on a I guess I guess a regular size you know block style target, and then I took the bear shaft with just the wrap on it and shot the first one and completely well I nicked the edge of the target and missed and lost the arrow out in the swamp out there mm-hmm. behind the ha- behind the cabin. 20 yards the from center of target to the edge of the target was probably well I guess they're what 20 inch square yeah but it was 10 inches 10 inches off at 20 yards with a bear shaft so then I went and stripped another one and then I aimed on the right side of the target and shot the fletched arrow and then shot and it was 10 11 inches to the left kicking hard uh, knock right, planing left. And I spent about 30 minutes and uh, got the bow tuned properly, got it set up, um, and got it to where the first bow, uh, the bear shaft and the fletched arrow were touching at 20, and I had a one-inch group at 30, bear shafts and, and uh, fletched arrows. Hmm. Kicked up the second bow, um, virtually the exact same thing, but worse. Hmm. And it took me about an hour to get that bow right. Uh, but I finally got that bow right and had them touching, uh, bear shafts and fletched arrows touching. I then took the same broadheads that they couldn't hardly even hit the target with. And, I didn't even shoot at the same dot. It was one of those blocks that's got like the nine dots on it. Yeah. Um, or no, 12 dots, 12 little, like two inch dots. Uh, I shot at each dot because I wasn't going to shoot them together and cut veins and bust arrows with the broadheads and literally stacked like, like stacked six straight dots at 30 yards with broadheads. Really? And they just could not, they could not believe that that was their bow. They just couldn't believe it. And then they got out there shooting and they felt like rock stars. They were shooting so well. Um, and then I set, I pulled all the pins off their bows and just left one pin and sighted them in dead on at 20. And they both shot and then they backed up to 30 and shot and they were both you know, three, four inches low at 30 Mm -hmm. and then, uh, backed them out to 40 and had them aim at the top center dot on the target with the same 20 yard pin. And they both shot and one was grouping a fantastic group about 12 inches low. And then the other one was, you know, about 13 or 14 low. So got them completely set up with one pin. They're never going to shoot over 30 anyway. So it doesn't matter. But they basically have one pin now that they can have one point of aim, perfectly grouping bow with broadheads. And if they would have, and here it is January, if they would have taken the time to do that in June or July, they probably would have been successful in their once in a lifetime Iowa trip, you know? That sucks. (laughs) But they didn't know any different. And they went to a shop and they told them to shoot expandables. That was the solution instead of tuning the bow. And crazy. so when people say, well, your broadheads fly good, they'll fly as good as your bow will shoot. And that's, that is, that is the honest answer. Well, you, uh, you take, a, you filled a lot of questions. I know we're off in third base here, but you take a lot of questions on tuning and stuff like that. What is the most common tuning issue that you run into when guys are having, having issues? Um, that center shot. Really? hundred percent center shot. Oh yeah. hundred percent. That's interesting. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 So most guys, they need to have their cam shim left or right. You know, I mean, that's, that is nine times out of 10 what it is because the, if they take it to a shop, the shop's going to square it on the burger button Mm -hmm. and then they're going to get it totally, you know, squared and true with the, you know, with the, uh, with the shelf and the, you know, going straight. Uh, and that's the way they're going to shoot it. And it's very rarely are they perfectly tuned like that. So today, both of these bows, I had to move their rest 
you know, over an eighth of an inch out to the left to get center shot. And people are like, well, the bow's not shooting right if the arrows, because, you know, if you think about it, the arrow's going to be pointing out to the left. It's not going to be pointing straight ahead. Right. But that may be what it takes to get the rest directly between the cams. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense because I've had a prime do that. And a lot of the guys that I know that shoot primes, dude, I was like, I was probably, I don't know what I was. I was way outside, meaning I was way left of center shot. But mine was too until I, you know, until I shim the cams over. Yeah, I didn't have anybody locally that could but, do that. So, yeah, but out of the box, I had <clears throat> both of my primes, I had the arrows angling way out to the left. Mm hmm. Um, but they, man, once you get your bear shafts and your fletched arrows grouping together, mm -hmm. man, you're, you, I don't really give a crap what the arrow's looking like when it's on the bow. I'm, I want to know what it looks like when it's in the target, you know? Right. Um, and, and they fly great. And at that point, you can pretty much put, um, whatever broadhead you want in front of it. I mean, you see, I shoot the big broadheads. Mm-hmm. You know the, the the our big inch and a quarter ones, and I can I can literally cut veins off you know out to forty yards with those heads. But the bow doesn't need fletchings. If you've got a fill point on the arrows, I mean the arrows don't need fletchings. I mean if you've got fill points on, you know I can group my bear shafts out to forty. So the fletchings aren't doing anything. They're, they're not they're not working to steer the arrow. So when you put your broadhead on, the only thing the fletching has to do is just offset that head. Makes I mean, sense. it's just working very light duty, you know? And you like to go with the helical too as well, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the tighter that thing spins, the, the you know, the better it's going to fly. Yeah. So, I mean, if helical didn't matter, there wouldn't be, uh, you know, <laughs> rifling in a barrel that'd just be straight and, you know, it'd be a hollow bore. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and I, I always break down the, you know, because I get a lot of tuning questions. It's you know, I break it down into three categories. It's either the shooter, the arrow, or the bow. And it seems like most of the time it's the bow. Um, I'd say probably like eighty percent of the time it seems like it's the bow that's causing some sort of issue. And I think that's because you have a lot of variables there um, that guys just don't completely understand and and or has anybody that they can tune it for them, whether that's because they live over East and they'll, like you said, they'll be like your, your, your buddies that had the Iowa tag that, you know, just toss some expandables on there and you'll be good to go. But yeah, what I see is that's it's, not how it works. Yeah. It's typically, it's typically the bow, probably the most common thing. And that would be right in line with what you're seeing for center shot. I'd count that as the bow, even though it's probably the, the shooter's fault for not setting it up correctly. Um, well, how, but, but, you know, how, how is the, how is the, the average guy that, you know, works his butt off every day and spends time with his family and I mean, has limited time to do what he needs to do. I mean, how is he supposed to know how to set a bow up and get it right? I mean, that's why you rely on people. So that's true. You know, uh, you know, to me, the, the best information to keep, to, to get put out there you know, is how to bear shaft tune a bow, uh, you know, matched up with your, you know, your fletched arrows. Hmm. Um, to me, that is the best information people could see because most people will, you know, fire it through paper at six feet, call it good and let it rip. Well, man, that's just one point in the arrow's flight. That's just one point, you know, and, you you can you can adjust a bow to get it timed right to shoot a bullet hole, uh, you know, at paper at six feet. But then when it gets to twelve, fifteen feet, it may be doing something totally wonky, you know. Right, right. I think it was Dave so, Cousins that had a video, and he you know he went through his paper tuning process, and his was six to nine feet or something like that. And he's like, that tells you what the arrow is doing coming out of the bow. He's like, you want to find what the arrow is doing when the arrow is down range. Shoot it, at, you know, shoot fifteen, twenty feet, or shoot. 10 yards or whatever it may be. And he's like, that'll, so he paper tunes different. I think it's Dave cousins. I hate, hate to throw a name out there like that, but, but he paper tunes at two different distances, um, to get two different sets of ideas of what his arrow is doing 
Um, one tells them more about the bow and, and the other distance farther out tells them more about what the arrow is doing. And I thought that was pretty cool. But this year I, I bear shaft tuned um, like what you were talking about this year. Um, I kind of went away from the paper um, shooting the evoke this year. Just yeah, well, we, we were talking a lot during your during your trials and tribulations getting these bows, mm-hmm. you know, to <laughs> set up. I oh, mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. you ha- you probably had some of the worst luck on bows that I've seen. I mean, <laughs> some I mean, of it's probably it just, self-induced. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if you <laughs> if you left that flood with you before you left down here because <laughs> our whole place is underwater. I know, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you had you had some bad luck this year, and and uh, you know, then you went and got another bow, and we started you know working through that, and I'm like, I mean, my first question was. <laughs> where's your bear shafts and your fletched arrows hitting a relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. And you were like, well, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm going to work through that and, and see, and I mean, it's just, it's always center shot, but it's easy to blame the arrow. And I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, arrows are pretty dead gum forgiving. I mean, there's a lot of, you've got a lot of uh, a pretty good span on what a spine, and a, you know, a, a certain, dynamic spine of an arrow will carry mm-hmm. it's a pretty good range um and that really becomes your fine tuning you know uh but just to get it started and get it hitting right it's nine times out of ten getting that center shot done so basically for people you know if you if if, if you drew a line basically top to bottom from your cam uh, and it was, let's say it was a, a, you know, a flat surface and those cams are traveling in a plane. Well, when it gets to where your rest is, if that plane is not where the true center of the riser is, then it's never going to shoot right. And you have to move that rest to get into the plane of the, tr- of the, of the travel of that, um, uh, of the two cams top and bottom. So it's, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to describe. Um, but, um, it, it, that's what it is in a, in a nutshell. It's just the, the path of the travel in a straight line is not always where these bow manufacturers have that, standard set square center shot location on their risers Hmm. because you could have one limb, one side of a limb that's weaker than the other. And it has a little bit of lean. Now it's moved it over a little bit Hmm. or, you know, they could not be perfectly square in the limb pockets. And so when they come up, you know, they may not be, um, you know, totally true coming straight back from the riser, then the riser could not be perfectly machine true. So you've got all of these variables that you're bolting together to build a bow. And then you're trusting that this thing is perfectly, you know, uh, squared up and very rarely are they. Right. Well, I really don't care if my arrow is angling out a little bit left or right, as long as it's flying true without fletchings. You know, I had the same conversation with Corey Miller this year. Because I told him, once I finally got my bow shooting where I liked, um, you know, I, and like I said, I, I like shooting broadheads, you know, as far as I can. You know, I'll, I'll shoot my stuff out to 100 yards just because to me that builds confidence. And I like to shoot farther than what I'm actually probably going to shoot in, in, in an actual hunting situation because it makes the shorter shots just slam dunks. But, uh, you know, his – his I, I told him, like, dude, I'm inside a, a center shot. And I'm like, and I, I can't fix it. Like I don't, I don't have the tools or the know-how to fix that. And he's like, well, mine's inside too. He's like, why do you care? <laughs> I was like, uh, I don't know. He's like, if it's shooting good and he's like, and it's close to center shot. He's like, mine's just inside. He's like, I guarantee you, your and my bows are set up identical right now. Just from what he was, what I was telling him. He's like, and he's like, I'm, I can shoot yeah. whatever I want. And, he's, and, and it shoots fantastic. And he's like, who cares if your arrow's pointed just a little inside? He's like that. He's like, who cares? He's like, he he's the same way. He's like, who gives a shit whether you're spoken from the, yeah, yeah, straight straight out of the mouth of one of the true masters. I mean, he's he's one of the best ever. Yeah, you I know, learned a lot from him. Yeah, this year he came down yeah. to uh, Roseburg and 
I told him like I want to I want to really figure this PSE out and I want to get better tuning. And uh, and so we went through uh, we went through my bow my bow and he's like we tore that whole thing apart and went down through matching limb deflections um, everything because every limb tells you what you know what the deflection is on it or what it's matched to and and I learned you know what the stamp, right. you know the numbers stamped into the limbs are and just things that you know if you, if no one ever showed you you would never know and um, and then so you know really getting this PSE figured out. And, uh, it was just really interesting that, you know, even though that the limbs weren't properly matched with the deflections, it was still shooting just fine. But if it wasn't, that was the, one of the things that we could have changed. Um, and, and like you said, a, an average Joe guy, he's, he doesn't care probably, or have the time, especially if he's got kids to, to go ahead and figure that stuff out. So, no, no. And here's the thing. I mean, you get a bow set up right with the timings right. You get it true center shot, regardless of how the arrow's pointing, whether it's inside or outside. But if you get that thing true center shot and your timing's right, I mean, if your form's good, you can change point weight 25 grains up and down and never notice a difference in flight. Now, you're going to notice a difference in impact high and low, but you're not going to change the spine enough to, to notice, you know, a huge difference in flight quality. We just can't shoot that good. And so I've got guys that call me and they're just obsessing over getting, you know, their, their bows, you know, and their bear shafts flying true. And they're like, man, I need to swap these heads. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm planing left and, you know, I'm, I'm showing stiff. I need to go with a heavier head. And I, you know, I, I need to change these heads out. I'm like, guys, 25 degrees is not, I mean, 25 grains is not going to solve your problem. What's going to solve your problem is getting your center shot correct. And so then I go through that process with them and they go, well, I say, okay, you know, move your, move your rest left. So, you know, what it's, let's say they have a QAD or whatever it is, move your, move it left two hash marks. Well, then they do it. They shoot it. Well, what is it? Well, it's still, it's hitting further left, which is going to mm -hmm. sight wise, but the angle of the arrow is not as, you know, kicked over anymore. I said, okay, move it two more hash marks left. Now aim on the far right side of your target. Cause it's going to keep moving left. And they're like, okay, I just shot it. The arrow is perfectly straight in the target. Now I'm like, okay, now move your sight over to that. Move your sight over left, bring it back in to where you're, you know, sighted in for that mm -hmm. with your arrow hitting perfectly straight. And they go, well, it's not right. And I'm like, what do you mean it's not right? It's flying perfect. Just do what I ask. So they sight it in. I'm like, okay, shoot a bear shaft into the bullseye. They hit it, you know, 25, 30 yards. Now I take a fletched arrow, shoot it. What happened? Hit the exact same spot. I said, <laughs> now you're tuned. They said, it's not right. My arrow's pointing left. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've been there, man. Who, who cares? <clears throat> I've been there. Yeah, the arrow guys... doesn't know. The arrow doesn't care. Yeah. I, it just know. wants to travel straight, you know? Yeah. I've, I've had that literally probably on two of the last five bows I've owned. My center shot hasn't been what you would say, you know, rabbit ears correct. Like my prime, dude, it was so far outside, like I said earlier. But I when I was testing broadheads and arrows that year, I shot five – I think it was five different broadheads at 40 yards, uh, five, you know, five different arrows, five, you know, in every single one of those arrows, I, I shot that prime better than any bow I've ever shot. Um, it just yep. aimed really well. And, uh, I, I, I was shaving veins, almost every single arrow with a different broadhead on there. And if you would have looked at this bow and put an arrow and cocked the uh, rest up, you'd be like, what in the hell's going on here? But at the same time, yeah. you know, that guy, if he was able to yoke tune, probably could have brought that rest back in towards center shot and, and been just fine too. But if you don't have, the, well, but some of these, some of these, some, most of the newer bows are not, you can't yoke to them anymore. Yeah. Well, the, the PSCs you know, because, are shims and, and the Matthews are, um, they got the top hats or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is, is like, you know, you, you, you can't really twist the, the yokes anymore because they're not, they're not connected anymore. They're going through these, these harnesses oh, that yeah. allow them to, to, to slip and slide. So you can't lean the cam anymore. I see what you're saying. So, because that, because that, those little rings or the little, 
you know, the little connector is going to gather back in the middle. So, but the, 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 the key to doing it is that if it bothers you, the arrows pointing out to the left or the right is you just take it and get the cam shimmed over. So if you've had to, it's real simple. If you've had to shim your, your rest, I mean, move your rest out, you know, an eighth of an inch to the left, then you need to slide your cams an eighth of an inch to the left. And then the arrow is going to be perfectly square and true with your bow. Mm -hmm. You just, you just found the path of travel where it, where it wants to be. So that's what, uh, I mean, that's what I do. I just get them set and I see how far I have to move it. And then I just shim the cams. And that's pretty much what you have to do on the new bows because you just really can't yoke to in the new bows anymore. Hmm. Well, that's one reason I like the Revertex so, so much this year um, is because it makes that process really fast and easy for guys. And I've thought about just buying that bow just so I could play with shimming the cam over because um, it has that cam That's lock. the one that you can – you can. it has the, that has the adjustment where you can just – turn the thing and screw it over left and right right yeah it's just an allen wrench it's just that simple and it's quick and easy and i'm like yeah. i you know I, I it wasn't my favorite shooting bow but uh just that right there to me is a huge benefit for guys especially you know ones that don't own a press or don't have really have the know-how and kind of want to get their feet yeah. into it i think that revolt x is a home run for guys that want to start doing that but well I'll, I'll be honest with you the the i've shot them all you know the last couple of years and the, the simple, the simple fix, simple version that I've seen that I like the best is the Matthews system. When you get the bow, it has uh, basically a thick washer on one side and a thin washer on the other. And most of those bows come pretty close to center shot. But if it's not and you have to move it, all you've got to do is just swap your washers. Hmm. You just put your thick one on the other side and your thin one on the other, and it moves it right where it needs to be. It's just a very simple system. But those have been the most consistent as far as, um, like, being center shot out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, and believe it or not, the other ones that I've had the easiest time um, tuning, I don't really like the bows for whatever reason that much. I just don't like the ergonomics of them. But the elites have been really easy to tune. Hmm. Um, but I just, I, I don't know. They're just, I don't know. Just kind of clunky to me, you know? Well, you and I had a conversation very similar to this one while I was there. And, um, and you were saying that a lot of the guys that are having issues are having, are shooting Hoyts. And I don't know. How, <laughs> I just want to toss that out there. Um, uh, but what, what yeah, kind I of issues I are those? I don't care. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not bagging on them. I mean, you just asked me. Correct. I mean, I talk, I talk to dozens of guys a day that are setting their bows up. I mean, it's all day, every day. And, you know, when you hear Hoyt, you know, three to one, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it just kind of sticks in your head. I don't have anything against them. I mean, I shot Hoyt's for years. I mean, the, when the Alpha Max came out, I'm dating myself, of course, but <laughs> man, that was like that the Alpha Max brought me back into compound hunting. I'd been trad hunting exclusively really? and I shot that and I loved that bow, you know, <laughs> and, uh, it took some tweaking to get it right. But see that bow, I knew that, you know, I could yoke tune it if I needed to. I knew when it started getting out, I knew what to do. Like in five seconds, I could have it back rolling again, but the newer ones, for whatever reason, you know, the guys have just struggled with them. Hmm. Um, and I don't know enough about them to tell you why. I'm just telling you that if 10 guys call me a day, it's almost, you know, four to five of them will be Hoyt guys. Hmm. And I don't know what it is. Yeah. You know? When you told me that when we were, when I was over there, I was like shocked. I was like, man, those are known to be really super easy to tune. I wonder why guys are having issues with it. And, and I, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost curious if it's more of the shooters on those because I think Hoyt has the best ground game. They do, in my opinion. I, I don't think anybody else has a better ground game. They, well, they just, they just lost Dudley, but um, you know, they, they have a lot of the oh, biggest well. shooters, the most popular names. Um, they're almost more of a marketing company any more than than anything else. I mean, they do such a good job marketing their products and getting their stuff out there. I wonder if they're getting that many people that just don't know what's going on or what to do. Um, I've been at a local shop here where guys will walk in and they literally say, I want Cam Haynes' bow. 
I want whatever he's shooting. And like, oh, okay, you ever shot a bow before? Nope, my first day. And they pull back the bow. This is a couple years ago when the I think the Defiant was out. And uh, they're just struggling to keep that bow back. It's pulling them off the back wall. And, they, and they're just like, I love this bow and I'm going to buy it. And then they walk out and they can't shoot it worth a shit. But it's what, you know, Cam Haynes well, was what shooting I would, that. What year. I would tell guys, guys that listen to your podcast that are, you know, looking to get new bows, new gear, new whatever. I would look at companies that have guys using their stuff that know how to work on their own stuff, how to build their own stuff, how to do it all. Because typically the companies that have all the famous name guys, it's, if the product is sound, you don't need those people. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the the cream rises to the top. If if you build it, they will come. If it's right, they'll buy it again. And that's my philosophy: is you know, don't take all your money and put it into you know social media influencers. Take your money and put it into R and D and buying quality components to make sure that your product is absolutely the best it can possibly be and the most user friendly that it can be. I mean, if you've been in the game, as long as some of these bow companies building, so, you know, so-called the best, you know, of this and the best of that, Mm -hmm. why do you need influencers? I mean, if you're such an established brand that builds all this badass stuff, why do you have to have, you know, all of this money getting, you know, pissed out every year, to have you know face people selling it for you the product at that point should be selling itself you know i mean some of these companies are industry icons they shouldn't need anybody makes sense yeah and, and, uh, to and, me it does well and at some point i mean i and i to play devil's advocate on that i do believe that you know the influencers they do they do help but i've also said at the other tip of the uh, the sword here that the worse your product is, the better your marketing has to be. And I've said that over and over and over again since I've even come out with the podcast and before because I just see every year, man, and and, and especially, and I'm going to probably piss somebody off here, but with mechanical heads, you see that probably more than anywhere else in, in any other industry. The shittier your product is, the more marketing you have to have. And I see that all the time, especially with broadheads. And, uh, and and I, you know you see it other with other gimmicky you know maybe clothes or, or scent killers or whatever it may be. Um, I've said that for a long time, so I totally agree. But I also do think there is a value. Um, not saying hanging your hat on on an influencer or anything like that, um, because you having me out there on that whitetail hunt, I guarantee you that's not going to make a, 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 probably a, a difference on your bottom line. It it won't. Um, I just don't carry the the that's weight. Why I do it though? I mean. That's- that doesn't have anything to do with why I even started the company. I started the company to help guys just like I helped my two buddies on the front porch of the cabin today. Mm -hmm. That's what I love to do. I love to see guys. I like to see the light bulb go off. And then I like to see critters hit the ground and then be super successful. Yeah. That's the only reason I did this. I mean, it's, it's not about the bottom line. I mean, it's not even close. Yeah. I mean, the whole industry has become a damn fashion show. (laughs) <laughs> and that's not what hunting's about, man. Um, and, you know, I, I'll tell you, I had a hard, hard conversation yesterday, you know, with, I'm just going to say a legendary name in the hunting industry that has the arrows and, you know, wanted to really work hard and help me promote the company and promote the product. And, you know, I just said, Hey, you know, here's what's got to happen. I mean, you know, if you're pushing expandables and repping expandables and strapped them to the front of your arrows, Mm -hmm. it's just not going to work for me because, you know, and the response was, is that, well, there'll be lots of arrows sold, you know, and that's not what it's about for me. What it's about for me is it's not just selling arrows and broadheads. What I'm trying to do is deliver a philosophy, a message. And, and it's a, it's a, I guess, a, a philosophy on 
what is the most efficient fail safe system to make the average bow hunter successful. Um, and it's not strapping a, uh, an expandable on the front of a great arrow, you know, I mean, get our arrows perfectly tuned, you know, tough components, great weight, great penetration, everything's great. And you put an expandable on the front of it. And in my mind, you're defeating the purpose, you know, um, and there's, you know, listen, there's going to, they're going to be shot forever. You know, there's nothing I'm going to do to, you know, change that. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that, but that's not what we're about. What we're about is delivering the message of eliminate all variables, any variable that's going to lead to a possible failure, eliminate it. Why take a chance? And that, that is, I mean, you've heard me say it dozens and dozens of times. Why take a chance? Right. It just doesn't make sense. So, well, I, anyway, to echo that's... on that, uh, I had a buddy who's a very successful, um, his whole family is very successful, uh, hunters in general, whether it be with a rifle or a bow. And, um, he's, he grew up being a competition shooter and won some things here and there. And, uh, they switched to severs this year, but they also went with a heavier arrow. And, uh, long story short, he was asking me if I wanted every single sever that he owned. Um, and I was like, well, yeah, I'll take them because I love testing shit out. But they lost, uh, they didn't lose, but they had to shoot an animal three times this year because they couldn't get more than six inches of penetration. And they were shooting probably yep. like a 450 grain um, arrow. And we're talking elk. And uh, yeah, and it was like, man, you know, and he's like, dude, I shot a 400 grain arrow pretty much my whole life. And I've blown through elk with a, that and a fixed blade. He's like, I'm never shooting an expandable again. And there was another giant bull. Uh, I didn't see pictures of it, but I, you know, saw the saw the story posted and everything. A guy shot a eight point Roosevelt uh, over here near where I live, and uh, said he got one lung, and then the the, uh, the arrow plopped right out. It just basically shot the arrow back out. But he got one lung, and he never found the bull. And he was shooting an expandable for the I think the first time. Um, you know, it's just like, and if, for example, I I can say honestly say I wanted to use and expandable this year hunting. I wanted to test it out and I wanted to test the severs out because that was the one that looked the best, most promising to me. But when the time came and I had that really nice Rosie in front of me this year, I reached for that sever and I started to pull it out and I was like, no, I can't, I couldn't, I literally could not bring myself to do it because I worked too damn hard and I hunted probably 20 days straight for that opportunity. And I reached for the fixed blade head I, I grabbed your e, your Evo. Yep. I grabbed a fixed blade head. I'm like, why why add just like you said another part of the equation that might not pencil out in the end? And uh, I just I literally could not do it. Now if it was a turkey, you know, for me that's another thing. I'll do it with a turkey. Um, I shot a turkey this well, year. Well, expandables are but expandables are great for turkeys. That's what I thought. That's the, the, they're perfect for that. You yeah, know? but that expandable um, bent on that turkey. I mean, it it literally. It, it has a really hard angle, or not a hard angle, it has a pretty good angle on one of the blades now, and it's like, man, that happened on a freaking turkey, <laughs> you know? Like, what would that do if I hit, you know, an elk through the scapula, or if I hit, you know, a, a hard rib or two on on a bull, or whatever it may be? Um, you know, and I've seen fixed blade heads fail, and when I say fail, I've seen them basically break into a million pieces on a rib bone. I've seen it happen. Um Absolutely. You know, that shit happens. And, and so I'm not saying it's, it's completely on a mechanical end, but you're, you're completely introducing a whole set of variables that if you want to kill that animal, then not only do you need to make a great shot, but then this needs to happen where it actually deploys. And uh, I just don't like that. It gives me anxiety. Well, the thing anxiety. is, is that, yeah, the thing with an expandable is, is you have to make a perfect shot. You have to. And it's got to be a perfect condition, perfect shot, broadside. And the, the big name guys out there, the great, great hunters, they can probably make that perfect shot every time. Hmm. But that they're the 1%. The other 90%, 99% of humans, us humans, are going to make mistakes. The animal's going to spin. It's a quartering away, quartering two. I mean, there's yeah. always some BS going on that's out of your control. And... You know, if you're not going to make 
if you don't have the ability to make a perfect shot under all conditions every time, then you can't afford to shoot expandables. You can't take that risk of it not working. Right. And so you've got to go to something that you know is not going to fail. And I just don't understand the concept. But again, you know, all these beauty queens are out there, uh, male and female, you know, getting paid big bucks uh, cause it's all about money, mm-hmm. you know, to promote these different expandable heads and they're doing the biggest disservice to the, you know, bow hunting community that, that could possibly be done. It's, it is, it's criminal. Hmm. It absolutely is criminal in my mind. So, yeah. Um, well, I, I, and I hear some guys, but it's say, not going to change. Yeah. Well, I hear some guys say that that are huge advocates for expandables that you don't have to be as accurate cause it's a larger cutting area i'm like okay well yeah i don't know man it, it's what about the shoulder exactly <laughs> exactly yeah yeah there's a reason i don't i i, I yeah. hit that bowl where i don't aim um and that's because i want more room for air and i i consider myself to be a decent shot with a bow compared to the average guy better than the average guy uh, but you get a, you know a guy like a levi morgan he's gonna kick the socks off of anybody i know in in you know hand me my bow, <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be ridiculous. You're not going to outshoot that guy. But, um, I, I consider myself a decent shot and I, I aim off of the shoulder and I aim, you know, a rib or two off the shoulder just because I want to get away from that hard bone on that shoulder. And it gives me more room for air front and back. I'm, I'm not aiming. I feel like when guys are aiming and you can tell me from your perspective, cause you've shot a hell of a lot more animals than I have. Um, the guys that aim for that magic triangle, you know, it's fantastic. It looks cool when you post a photo and there's a hole, what appears to be in the shoulder, but it's not, um, and, and that animal's dead and it's a quick, good, quick kill. You know, you hit exactly where you're aiming, but your, mar- your margin for air is so small. If you have like a eight inch pie plate, you're aiming for like the last two inches of that pie, pie plate on the left. And I just don't, I'd rather aim for the middle and then know if I hit anywhere on that pie plate, it's dead. Not if I aim. Well, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I would tell you that um, it's not a one size fits all. So if, if your aiming point is not going to be in the golden triangle uh, and you're not going to aim there, um, then, and you're going to aim a little bit further back, you also have to change the elevation of your aiming point. So you can't aim that low if you shift back six inches. Because at that point, you're going to be behind the heart, below the lungs. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many arrows hit like that where people think, that's the perfect shot. It's not. So if you're going to slide back and shoot for a bigger target, you actually have to come up a little bit too. And you always want to aim in the the bottom, kind of the bottom third of what the lung would be. Um, which is a, he's probably on an elk would be about, you know, eight or 10 inches up or a little bit more from the bottom. Mm-hmm. And most people keep everything that low. And then they, when they slide it back, that's where you have your failure. But if you think about it, 50% of your vitals are behind the shoulder. So, you know, you've got to shoot a setup that if you do miss a little bit and you do get up towards that shoulder, you're still going to get into those valuable vitals and into that thoracic cavity. That's what's important. You can't set your bow up for a perfect shot. It's not going to happen. They're animals. It's wildlife. It's nature. Shit happens, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know, man. I, 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 I'm glad there's guys getting good messages out there. It just seems like the really popular ones are getting a bad one out and it's all about, dead gum money you know right well it doesn't matter how much it's just a disservice yeah and you know i I wish i had a a bigger voice because i I, for me it it you know i I literally have zero sponsors uh i'm pro staff for one company that's because i buy enough of their products it's nice to get a discount um but you know it's it's for me if i ever got paid i mean man, you'd, you'd know it was because of the right reason. I wish more guys and not to toot my own horn here. Um, uh, but I wish there was more guys that had platforms like mine that would, that would have a bigger voice, you know, like there's just not enough out there that, that do. And I, I, 
I think it's mainly because a lot of the biggest guys are probably, and I'm not picking on Eastern guys over here, but whitetail is like the largemouth bass of the outdoor industry. It's everybody it, loves largemouth. It large, is. You know, and the lighter arrow and mechanical setups are what hit home with a lot of those guys for a multitude of reasons, whether it be they don't have time to tune it, the shops can't tune it, or they're trying to get a quick turnaround, so they just toss a mechanical on there. Um, the mentality is just, I think it's so ingrained and so old running. It's so old, just that's the way it's been for so long. It's almost, if you're talking different, people almost don't take you seriously in a, in a lot of circles. Oh, for sure. You know, you know, a lot of the Eastern market is, you know, pick the bow up September 15th, <laughs> go to the pro shop, get new arrows, get some pack of expandable broadheads go home, sight the bow in, shoot it for two weeks, bow hunt for 30 days, put it down, pick up the rifle. Mm. I mean, that's, that is the, you know, modus operandi of the Eastern hunter as a whole, you know, in bulk. Mm. That's not really the guy that I'm ever going to reach in mass. I'll reach a few, but I won't reach the bulk of those people. You know, the, the people that I will reach are the guys that, have made a decision that they're going to be a bow hunter mm-hmm. and they've made a decision that they're going to hunt with that bow exclusively all year. And they've, you know, made a commitment to themselves that they're going to dive in and understand their equipment better. They're going to learn why things do what they do. And they're committed to become a proficient lethal bow hunter. And those are the guys that we're going to reach. And that's okay. I mean, that's what, that's what makes the world go around is having all different types of people and different types of, you know, skill sets. And those are the guys though, that I want to be able to talk to one-on-one and explain to them why the failures they've had in the past have happened because I've had the same exact things happen to me. And here's how I correct it. And here's how maybe I can offer to help them correct what they're doing. And it's just, it's fun, man. It's a good feeling to do it. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, I think that what's encouraging to me is it seems like that number, that small percentage of guys that want to do it right. It seems like that number is getting bigger every year, which is really encouraging to me. Yeah. I've noticed that the heavy arrow trend is definitely getting some momentum. Um, whether it be from, you know, an Ashby, uh, follower or whether it be from just somebody that listens to a podcast, there's definitely, I think the average arrow weight's definitely on the rise. And I know mine's getting heavier every year I hunt. Um, just, yep. you know, just, I just, I'm not married to anything. You know, I'm not afraid to change something. Um, I, 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 this is the first year I shot over 500 grains. Um, I shot 535, yep. I think all year. And then, um, I think right now I'm currently shooting 515, um, and that's just because I'm using a different spine. Um, I went to a lighter spine of your arrows because I I used um, I was shooting league last night, <laughs> and I and I all yeah. my arrows were uh, bloody or had veins that were trashed from from uh, I only right. had a couple arrows. <laughs> so, but I want to get back into into Alabama before we wrap this thing up here because you you guys did okay. something yep. that you were talking about um, after after we shot that doe. And you're cleaning it up, and I'm watching, you know, watching you do your thing, wanting to see how, how an Alabama guy does, you know, cl- takes care of a deer, and just enjoying the experience and stuff. You, you cut the jaw off, and uh, like from the back of where the jaw meets the joint up to like the very front of the teeth, uh, right? And then you yeah, put it just in this. Took, just took one side of the lower jawbone out. Yeah. yeah. Um, walk me through that, and then also, um, you know, that's. That's probably because you're part of that program you're talking about, but I, I just like to hear a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, I mean that's been that's been the you know standard tool uh, for biologists um, to age deer for for years and years and years for decades, and it's just the easiest way to get a good average uh, of the you know age class of the different deer on the on the you know, on the property. So, you know, every location is different, but you know, when these guys like this year, they'll come pick up probably 70, 80 jaw bones at the end of the season, you know, bucks and does, mm-hmm. and they have a number on them. And then they, it's, 
that number's cross-referenced to the little sheet we fill out, whether it's a, a doe or a buck, and if it's a buck, you know, how many points, and then we put the live weight of every deer, and, you know, whether it has milk or not, if it's a doe, so which means it's whether it's had fawns, and we put all that information down there, and then they can go through and say, okay, well, you know, your average age is this for your bucks, your average weight for your does is this, you know, out of your two year old and older does, 90% of them are lactating, which means that they're reproducing at a proper rate, all that jazz, you know, and so they can look for any, you know, indicators that there's a problem, you know, uh, if there's a certain age class that's completely missing, they know that something happened in that year, you know, makes sense. Um, so I don't know. It's just the way that they, you know, generate their, their information and the jawbones, the quick, you know, it's just the quick reference way to age them. And you just base it on the tooth wear, of course. Right. Right. You well, know, between the, how much the dentine and enamel shows that type of thing. I wish our, uh, I wish our, uh, department of forestry would do something like that. I mean, they require you to, to bring things in on bears and stuff, but, um, the decisions that they're making here locally. It's like I was talking about uh, to my stepdad, who's on the um, Oregon hunters association local board here in Roseburg. And I was telling them, I'm like, you know, they got something, they got something figured out that we don't cause they're taking the whole jawbone and they're getting more data than just, we can optionally age our animals. And that's just a complete option. And I don't think they do anything with that um, information. It's just for the hunters, um, you know, interest. And, uh, I feel like we're missing the boat over here. I kind of want to like kidnap some of your forester or uh, your wildlife biologists and have them come teach our guys a, f- a few things because we're making some really silly decisions right now in Oregon with our deer management, in my opinion. And, um, you know, well, shooting it's, spikes it's, and, a, it's, it's a different philosophy though, with different species. I mean, you've got to realize that, you know, the majority of your deer and elk in Oregon are not going to get weighed. You know, a lot of them are going to get quartered up on the mountain. Right there's really no way to get the data that they need. That's um, a good point. You know, and then the other thing is, is y'all shoot virtually zero does. So, you know, you're not really dealing with an overpopulation issue like we are. So we're overpopulated and we're trying to figure out, are we to a point to where the herd's not healthy? You know, if these does should be weighing 130 and they're weighing 100, we've got way too many and there's not enough habitat to support them. Hmm. Just simple math like that. You know, you guys are kind of in a different, you know, different deal. So, and again, the other thing too is, is like, especially like with elk, you know, you have to report how many points it has, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when you kill something, don't you have a harvest report? We have, yeah. And that, that's probably come within the last, I'm going to say 10 years, but probably more recent than that. Yeah. Yeah. So usually with a harvest report, they can basically age class. You know, you're going to have so many spikes shot, so many three points, four points, then so many five buys and six buys. And they're just going to say, you know, you've got your spikes, then you've got your, you know, year and a half to two and a half year old bulls. Then you've got your three and a half to four and a half, five and a half year old bulls. Then you got your real old ones, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they can pretty much derive a lot of that information just from the the racks you know um but it's it's again it's just a it's a function of where we are all the deer are coming back to a location they're not getting quartered up and put in a backpack and and walked out so you have the ability to weigh them and do those types of things you know yeah so it's just a different different uh different um you know, set of circumstances that allows us to do that. And I'll be honest with you. Don't look at Alabama for, (laughs) you know, guidance on wildlife herd management because, you know, it's the craziest crap I've ever seen. You know, they say, you know, for years we could only kill does from December 26th to January 5th or something like that Hmm. for years. And, I mean, we were just getting way out of control. And then it got to the point where you could kill two deer a day. You could kill a buck and a doe a day for 120 days. Well, how much sense did that make? 
Yeah. And then they go to this three buck, one doe a day thing to promote shooting more does. Okay. But then they open the archery season up October 15th. And the first 10 days of archery season until the 25th is bucks only. Well, if you can only kill three bucks a year, why would you even have a buck only section when you're trying to promote killing as many does as possible to lower the population? Why would you take the first 10 days of archery season when archers kill more does than the gun guys do? Why would you take 10 days away from them to shoot does? And when the deer are the least um, educated, early season when deer are just in their summer patterns, doing their thing. So we, our first 10 days, we can't shoot does. That's crazy. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world because October 15th, I want to be driving on them. I want to have every day I can get before the rut starts to knock does over hmm. because I want to have all those does out of the way before we start really seeing our big deer. But we're, they're cheating us out of 10 days to do it when it's the easiest time to do it. Yeah. So, well, that and so, you're, you're getting I don't before know. they I mean, there's breed. all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, yeah. What's that? Uh, I said you be getting, be, be getting them before they breed too. So you're, you're, I feel like you're yeah. going to do a better job of managing them from that aspect too. Well, it just it just doesn't make any sense, and you know, we have no tag system, so you have to call and check in, you know, check in your deer, but you know, you, you know your bucks, but the it, it's an honor system. Hmm. I mean, there's the, it, how hard would it be for us to get three buck tags like Texas does? You know, when you buy your Texas license, it prints out and it's got your three buck tags. One can be a mule deer. You know, it's got your doe tags, your turkey tags. Everything's on your license. When you shoot a whitetail buck, you put your tag on it. Well, we don't have that. So you go from people that have hunted their whole life being able to shoot a buck a day right. for the entire season to three, which three sounds like an incredible amount to a Western person to somebody from Alabama. They feel like, well, we just got cheated out of 117 bucks. <laughs> so uh, seriously, that's some of the mentality. So, huh. and without having a tag to put on them, there's no check and balance. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things to where it, the, they've got the philosophy, right. But the execution's kind of poor, you know? Yeah. That's insane. Well, I know yeah. when I bought my license, it came with, it said unlimited does and three bucks and it was like less than 200 bucks. I'm like, this is, it just seemed dirt cheap, you know, like dirt cheap. And, uh, yeah, it's cheap. Yeah, I'm telling you. I and that's, and Hey, it. and that's your, that's your hunt. Everything. That's small game turkeys. That's everything. That's really? not just deer. Hmm. Yeah, that is a hunting license. You let her rip tater chip and go shoot whatever you want. If it's in season. How long is that good for? Uh, why it's, it's, I don't know when it renews. I guess it renews in September. Mm. I think it's like, it's like season to season. You know what I mean? It's not like a calendar year license. Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause, uh, yeah. California is the same way. I think somewhere around July. Uh, I got a lifetime license in 1985. Did you? <laughs> but, yeah. Or maybe it was eighty nine. Could have been eighty nine. Oh shoot, that's the year. I it was, was either eighty five or eighty nine. <laughs> but in the in the eighties, I got a lifetime license, so I haven't had to buy a license since I was fifteen, sixteen years old. That's so, crazy. Uh, yeah, so I really don't know <laughs> when the license renew. I know it's embarrassing to say, but it's the mm. truth. Well, I I think uh, uh, Alabama is a pretty cool state, and unfortunately, there's not much more for for public land probably than than a little bit of that southern area um that you were talking about in alabama but um yeah for, I'd, I'd suggest it. a lot of guys i get that you know my number one question from people over here is would you know how'd you like it or would you go again or you flew all the way over there for does <laughs> so uh like my buddy my, my hunting partner just couldn't literally not comprehend um flying all the way over there for an animal that we have here i'm like well we don't have those animals here that's a completely different species <laughs> you know like 
you don't you don't say an axis deer is a black tail do you you know it's a completely different species man and and um he just couldn't he had a hard time wrapping well the his head thing is it. is that i mean think about this i mean if you'd have had good weather like most of these other guys have had when they've come and you come over here and shoot eight or ten deer and in a week man you have honed your skills to a level that no one out there can even touch because they just you don't have the opportunity i mean and so when the elk steps out it's like oh my gosh it's like shooting a school bus compared to those alabama yeah, <laughs> that's correct <laughs> i mean it's like everything's in slow motion mm-hmm. with these with these with the western game stuff compared to ours oh yeah i'm not i'm not like disparaging them because i love to hunt western game i'm just saying it's it seems like it's in slow motion compared to what we do I, and I, I, totally I think once that. you've hunted here, you would have to agree with that. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, you guys aren't hunting deer. You're hunting crackheads over there. I mean, it is, it is, <laughs> it's, it's really quite impressive how switched on those animals are, man. Cause I, you know, you could talk about it, but until you've actually seen it, uh, like that one doe that busted me when I was, um, trying to draw on her after she pretty much walked by me and she was walking a 45 degree angle away. I was like, after that, I was like, dude. I don't even know if I can get this done on a doe. Like, I don't even understand how I can draw my bow back. And, um, well, and and, and it goes to extreme levels that you would never even believe, but you've seen how they're switched on and they're twitching and jumping and they're like spooked by their own shadow. Yeah. Well, if you're watching a deer come in and you watch it and every time it spooks, it kind of, leans back and fades right leans back and fades right like the way it came in Mm -hmm. so it's always leaning back fading like like flinching back right flinching back right well if you're you know observant and you've shot enough of these deer you know when that bow goes off that deer is going to drop spin back right now, there's some deer you'll watch when they're feeding, and when they flinch, they'll kind of flinch and step forward like an antelope wheel or something. And you know, okay, that this deer has a nervous tendency. He, he's wanting to go that way. He's not wanting to go where he came from. He's wanting to go forward. So you know on that deer, you're going to hold low, but you're pretty much going to hold low right on the leg. And then the deer that's like, you know, flinching back right or back left, fake, you know, back and away, you know that you need to hold back almost center you know at the very back of the lungs Mm -hmm. and below its belly because it's going to drop and spin backwards and basically bring its lungs into the arrow it is the craziest shit (laughs) ever and people don't believe it until they hunt them and they're just like yeah goodness these things are crazy i took a video right after i shot that doe and um just on my phone. And I don't know if I actually posted this one, but I was so stoked. <laughs> like my heart was beating. <laughs> I, I remember telling you, I'm like, dude, I can't believe, I can't believe how excited I am about a doe. Like not, not to, you know, demean a doe or shooting a doe is, you know, anything less than anything else. But I just, you know, never grown up where I, you just don't get excited about them. But when I had that doe walk in and I drew on her, it felt like I was drawn on an elk. Like that's how much my heart was beating. And it was like, Holy smokes, this is just... Well, when you get your, when you get your stuff kicked in, you know, your teeth <laughs> kicked in for four days, Bob, yes. and you finally get one down, you're like, thank yeah. goodness. Yeah, well, I, I, I knew it wasn't going to be... Like, from what you told me, I'm like, okay, it's not going to be probably easy, but it definitely... I didn't expect it to be hard, and uh, it wasn't physically or anything. It was just it was just hard to get an, an opportunity at one, um, and I had, dough, I had a dough, and I tell this story probably a few times now, you know, I had this doe, I was sitting in a tree stand and I had this doe and I was not almost nodding off. I was like leaning my head up against a tree and every once in a while I'd, I'd close my eyes for a second or two and then I'd pop back up and, or open my eyes, but I wouldn't move my head or anything cause I didn't want to move. And, uh, I must have went 15, 20 seconds with my eyes closed. And then I opened my eyes and I see movement out of the bottom left of my vision, like my peripheral and this old doe's looking at me. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, this this freaking old doe came in looking at me. Like she knew before she even got there where she knew to look, what she was looking for. Yep. And I was like, that's not fair. I'm like, that's not fair. And she had a friend with her that I wanted to shoot. But 
and her friend was oblivious <laughs> to the world. And uh, but this this yeah. old doe, she knew, man. I was like, that's not that's not fair. <laughs> I'm like, I did not move. Yeah, well, it it is definitely the World Series of bow hunting, man. It 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 hones your skills for sure. And I'm glad you got to come do it. I had a ball, buddy. I I uh, uh, I can't wait to get you back when it's when it's cold and the weather's good and you know, I like doing impromptu deals. Mm -hmm. I like to be able to call and say, Hey, I just got the 10 day forecast seven days from now. It's going to be perfect. You need to come. That's the way I like to do it because it's just so it's such an expense and it's such an endeavor to come this far. Yeah. And when you plan it so far ahead and then the weather's crap, you just, it's, it's hard, man. It's just not, you know, it's not productive. Yeah. Well, just for, um, I mean, I was talking to Wes um, from uh, Bro, and he's been over there. And he just, after he found out I was there, he got really excited. And, you know, he's like, dude, you, you know, like, did you do this? Did you see this? Did Brian do this? And, <laughs> and it was just, uh, you know, if I, if I ever get invited back, um, you know, it would be crazy. I would totally, yeah, I'll be one of those guys that if you call me, you know, a few days in advance, I will totally drop what I'm doing and go over there. Like, it was it was so fun. And, and I know Wes had the same mentality. You know, he's, once you bring up Alabama, you just see him, you can hear it in his voice. He lights up like I do. And uh, I know it's probably the same for him, except uh, he, he told me the story of that big buck he let walk. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you, can, yeah. you can just hear it in his voice that, you know, he screwed up. <laughs> well, it was, uh, when, when I, conditions were right, they were just normal conditions when Wes was here. Mm-hmm. And he got to see full tilt Peterbilt, wide ass open Alabama rut, you know, and it was just mm-hmm. buck after buck after buck, just crazy chasing, rutting. And man, those guys were just having a ball. And, and, um, actually Wes texted me today and uh, we were talking and I told him, he, I said, man, if you want to come down here next year, all you gotta do is text me and say, <laughs> Hey, I got these days open, just come, you know? Huh. So it, he's, uh, he was, he was so jealous that you got to come. He was so <laughs> jealous that he didn't even know you were here. <laughs> yeah. Until I didn't, you got here. So. I didn't really tell anybody. Well, if we can plan it and, and if I ever get invited back, you know, I would love to share a camp with Wes. I mean, he is, him and I are two peas in a pod, man. He's, he's a fun guy to, to, to hang out with. So, um, if, you he's know, a if positive you ever, person, yeah, if that's he, what I like. He's a positive person. Yep. Oh yeah. Well, if you ever so, got an extra spot, well, buddy, I had a good time, man. Yeah, and yep. uh, we need to get you over here for Rosie's sooner or later. Maybe not next year um, for scheduling reasons, but uh, definitely the year after that. I and if you want to come next year, I'm totally down to have you. But we need to get you over here for Rosie. What's well, gonna happen, man? That's the that that is probably number one on my list uh, of things I'm dreaming to do is 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 uh, hunt for Roosevelt. So. I've just never, it's always been so in, intimidating to me. <laughs> um, just because of the kind of areas y'all hunt and you're hunting timber company land and there's a mm-hmm. lot of people and, you know, it's, I just, I really want to do it right. And I want to do it the first time with somebody that knows the rope. So, mm-hmm. but anyway, buddy, I enjoyed it. I appreciate you having me on and I look forward to talking to you again. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, Hey, I appreciate you coming on and uh, I'm sure we'll have you on again here this year sometime. Sounds good. All right. See ya. Okay. All right, everybody. That's this episode of the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Brian did me a solid, invited me on this whitetail hunt with no expectations. He just did it from one friend to another, wanted to hang out, get to know me a little bit better. And uh, I, I'm not sponsored or pro staffed by Brian. I just want to make sure that I'm very clear with that. Uh, but, so when I say this, I, I believe it because I've used his gear all year. Uh, great arrows great broadheads and i haven't really had any issues um, as we discussed when the bow's shooting good and the shooter's shooting good his arrows absolutely shoot the broadheads absolutely shoot and uh you know i was getting good flight and everything and and um, just really appreciate uh, what he's done for me this year and allowed me to test his stuff so uh, if you're looking for a good arrow setup you want to go a little bit on a little bit over the heavier side get over 500 grains and you want a micro diameter shaft this is definitely a really good option, and I'd give him a check out. And that's Day Six Gear. He has a website, or you can go on to Instagram, um, 
get a hold of him there. He's very re uh, receptive and responsive to guys who have questions or issues tuning. Um, and, and he's a wealth of knowledge. So uh, be sure to go check him out. And he's totally got, you know, my on-point approval. The guy's got a good product. And, and I wouldn't be using it uh, if I didn't believe in it. So outside of that, appreciate you guys listening. And I will see you on the next one. Bye.